you know, they support that I left her. Before she, when I started stabbing her and she opened her eyes, she recognized me. Yes. And then I told her, Michaela, pray, I'm going to kill you. And she started praying. And she was praying when I killed her. And when she stopped praying, after that she blew out of breath. That sound clip is from the testimony of Marinda Stain. She is describing the murder of Michaela Valentine, which is one of the 11 murders to which she pleaded guilty of either directly committing or being involved in. The savage murder of 11 people would be horrifying enough, but the circumstances around these murders created an even more complex and unbelievable tale of revenge, religious obsession, and motherhood gone very, very wrong. Marinda Stain was convicted, along with five other people, including her own son and daughter, who were minors at the time of the murders. Welcome to True Crime South Africa. This is Episode 4, The Krugersdorp Killers. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank each and every person who has downloaded and listened to the first three episodes of the podcast, as well as all the people who have interacted on our social media forums. I'm not an investigator, journalist, or member of the law enforcement community, but this podcast, the blog, and the community which is forming around it is a dream for me. And with your support, I hope to be able to run this podcast as part of a permanent creative entrepreneurship portfolio I am building. Your feedback and support are so important to me, so please keep on sharing all our episodes and spreading the word so that I can keep on bringing you the content you deserve. While the podcast is a one-woman endeavor, so I do all of the research, script writing, recording, producing, and editing myself, I cannot guarantee the success of the podcast myself. That is up to you, our amazing listeners. With that said, I won't hold up the good stuff anymore. Let's get into the case of the Krugersdorp Killers. For those of you who have accessed my content on my website at truecrimesouthafrica.com prior to the launch of the podcast, you'll be familiar with this case, as I've already released a few blog posts about it. The information in this podcast is going to be slightly different from that, though, and I'll be updating those blog posts as well. Researching this case has taught me that I cannot always rely on media reports for accurate information, and after the final verdicts were handed down in this case, I started watching the trial footage all 10 to 20 hours of it, and figured out that not only was there a lot more valuable information in the testimony than had been in the articles, but some of the info was inaccurate. It is very important to me to ensure that the information I include in my podcast and blog is accurate, and I will always preface information that is not fact with the disclaimer that it is my opinion or hearsay. I will therefore be changing the way I research in future and rely more on trial testimony where available, than media reports. The story of the Krugersdorp killers starts in 2012, although, as is the case with all killers, the true tale behind their murderous intent was formed long before that. This case is quite complex, with many people involved, so I'll start off by giving you a broad overview of events, and then get into the details after that. The story takes place in a town called Krugersdorp in Gauteng, South Africa. Krugersdorp was founded in 1887 as a town to support the gold mining community which had sprung up in the area known as Witwatersrand at the time. Today it is home to over 140,000 residents, has a booming city centre and some of the best schools in Gauteng. At the end of 2007, Marinda Stain, who was 41 at the time, attended a church meeting and was introduced to Cecilia Stain, who was just 24. Despite having the same surname, they're not related. The pair was introduced by Ria Grunewald, who was a prominent member of the church group they all attended. As part of the broad overview, I will say that Ria and Cecilia's friendship ended badly, but Marinda had by then become very close to Cecilia, and their friendship endured. Marinda had introduced her to her children, LaRue, 10 at the time, and Marcel, 7. Their friendship circle would grow to include Zach and Michaela Valentine, and eventually John Barnard. These six people 
I exclude Michaela Valentine, as she would eventually become one of their victims, would form a bond which has been described as everything from a business enterprise to a cult to a family. They would go on to commit 11 murders between 2012 and 2016 and commit acts of terrorism, fraud and racketeering. Now that you have a general idea of the people and circumstances we're going to cover, let's get into a deeper dive of the characters and events which would unfold. Cecilia Stain, who is now 35 years old, claims to have had a difficult childhood. When specifically questioned about this in her trial, she refused to go into detail about the type of abuse she had suffered, although she denied it was sexual in nature, and would only say it was physical. Her parents, when interviewed, stated that she was a problematic child, and her father admitted that Cecilia had lied quite easily from a young age, and would eventually make up stories about almost everything that was brought up in conversation. To paraphrase his statement, he said that if you were an alcoholic, then Celia would claim to be a worse alcoholic, or if you were sick, Cecilia was always sicker. Her father went on to say that he felt that her mother was to blame for not having disciplined her and for covering up for her, although he admitted that even he hadn't believed some of the claims by teachers about his daughter's behavior. Coincidentally, Miranda and Cecilia attended the same high school, although years apart, and Miranda would later testify that when they had shared stories about their school days, Cecilia had told her that she had been very rebellious and she had gotten involved with the wrong people and dabbled in Satanism. She had claimed to have assaulted one of her teachers. When Cecilia was 16 years old, she met Dries Stein, who would go on to become her husband. They had two children together. Cecilia's husband was a policeman, a strange twist of fate, considering that the flat he shared with his wife at the time would become the vortex for a major criminal series. Cecilia's health would become an important factor in this case. She testified that her health problems began when she gave birth to her daughter prematurely due to her suffering from preeclampsia during her pregnancy. Mother and child both spent time in ICU, and Cecilia claims to have contracted an infection from the hospital, which damaged her lungs and heart. She lists her further health problems as asthma, a stomach ulcer, chronic bronchitis, high blood pressure, and autoimmune disease. She was also diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder, previously known as multiple personality disorder. I will delve into this disorder a bit later. Cecilia has been touted as the ringleader of what would become known as Electus Per Deus, which is Latin for chosen by God. She has denied this allegation, stating that the crimes for which she was found guilty went on around her without her knowledge. She testified that she was a member of the South African Communist Party and the ANC Women's League. Watching the trial footage, Cecilia comes across as quite arrogant, and she was often blatantly verbally aggressive towards the prosecutor and made several sarcastic remarks. She seemed to have zero regard for the seriousness of the crime she was on trial for, and no concern for the pain of the victim's families. Even if an accused is truly innocent, in my opinion, if you are part of a trial of that nature, where there is so much grief and sadness in one room, you do not make flippant comments and behave as though you are thoroughly bored with proceedings. It also struck me as quite odd that when others were testifying against her and making statements that she would claim were complete fabrications, she had absolutely no reaction. I am aware that the accused is advised not to behave emotionally or have major reactions to witness testimony, but if I was on trial and claiming to be innocent and the type of stories were being told about me, that were being told about Cecilia, I don't think I could help but at least have a change in facial expression, a frown, a look of shock perhaps, but not Cecilia. She didn't even shake her head. She just sat in the dock and stared ahead, sometimes taking notes. The oldest of the group, at 52 years old, Marinda Stain made her living as a high school English teacher. She is divorced and a mother of two, who is described by a previous employer and colleagues as an excellent teacher who preferred to keep to herself. It has been mentioned, and I do agree, that Marinda bears a striking resemblance to Daisy Demelka, who was the first woman to be hanged in South Africa after having murdered two husbands and her own son. Quite honestly, I think she only bears that resemblance because of what we now know, by her own admission she has done. Had she not admitted to and being convicted of the heinous acts which were uncovered, I would probably see her in the streets and not look twice. She looks like anyone's mom or young grandmother. 
Perhaps it is her absolute normalcy that makes the evidence she gave under her plea deal all the more shocking. Miranda is clearly a very intelligent woman. Her father was a psychologist, and she seems to have a keen understanding of the operation of the human mind. She was pinpointed as the director or manager of the group, and I can absolutely see her being the one to have coordinated many of the criminal plans. There is just one thing that I think stands in the way of this idea, Miranda's clear obsession with Cecilia Stain. There is a photograph of five of the accused sitting in the dock, and it tells a story. Zach Valentine and LaRue Stain are tucked into one corner. LaRue scooted as far away from his own mother, who is beside him, as he can get. He needn't bother, though, because she is paying him absolutely no attention. She has turned to face Cecilia, who she describes as her very best friend, sitting beside her. They stare into each other's eyes, and it is almost the first time I've seen any remnant of a human emotion on their faces. Miranda's expression is one of complete adoration, and Cecilia's of an almost maternal tolerance. Marcel sits to one side, seemingly fitting in nowhere. Now 20 years old, Marcel Stain is Marinda's daughter. Marcel matriculated with six distinctions and is described as an introverted girl who likes to read. It is reported that she tried to refrain from journalists taking photographs of her, but of course many have succeeded. And as you look at this young, fresh-faced girl sitting in the dock of a courtroom, it is quite plausible to believe that she was innocent of the crimes of which she is accused. She looks like the type of girl you'd be happy for your son to bring home. When you hear about the things that Marcel was involved with, though, indeed, even while she was studying for those matric exams she so easily aced, you begin to wonder exactly what type of person hides behind the mask of innocence. Marcel initially pleaded not guilty to the charges against her, but eventually decided to, according to her, testify and tell the truth, admitting to her own part in the crimes. She claims that she decided to do this because she realized after her arrest that everything that she had been told by Cecilia was a lie, and that Cecilia was not who she claimed to be. Marcel testified that her mother was lying in her testimony to protect her and Cecilia. Her lawyer presents her as a child who was overwhelmed by the situation she found herself in and saw no way out. The evidence that was led against her, though, told a very different story. LaRue is Marcel's brother, and there seems to be a tangible bond between the two, but it is also clear that Marcel was treated quite differently to LaRue, and even his mother's testimony would be pointedly against him. At 22 years old, he accepted a plea deal and was sentenced to 35 years in jail, wearing a black shirt and black jeans. LaRue has visible tattoos of a werewolf and a bat. LaRue did not have much of a relationship with his father, according to him, due to pressure from his mother, until the age of 18. He had then reconnected with his father, and they began to build a relationship, going fishing and building cupboards together. LaRue gave evidence in court against his co-accused, including his mother and sister, and in so doing, he had to admit the extent of his own horrifying involvement in the group's crimes. Zach Valentine is 32 years old, and for most of his adult life worked as an insurance broker after having graduated cum laude from Northwest University. In almost every photo taken during the trial, Zach is smiling. I cannot say whether it is a spontaneous smile, or one simply to show his utter disdain for the process, but photos of him are quite disturbing. Little information is available about Zach's childhood or family life but I did manage to ascertain that he has a brother who is strikingly similar in appearance, and his parents appear to have had little contact with him. Miranda would testify that she had become aware that Zach and his parents were not talking at some stage, because Zach had pierced his ears. In this day and age, I can only imagine an extremely conservative family refusing to talk to their adult son because he had pierced his ears. But we must remember that for Zach Valentine, lies drip off the tongue the way the rest of us have normal conversation, and it is quite possible that there is a very different reason for the rift. In November 2010, Zach married his girlfriend, Michaela Bailey. They would be married for just two years, when in 2012, Michaela was found murdered in their home.
John Barnard was the last to join the group and was 42 years old at the time of his conviction and sentencing. He was a printer by trade and was single with one child. John was put on trial separately from the other members of the group in 2016 after he accepted a plea deal to testify against the others. John Barnard would be the weak link that broke the chain. At the time of Marinda and Cecilia meeting, Ria Grunewald was deeply involved with Cecilia. Cecilia would claim that the relationship was of a sexual nature, which Grunewald denies. Cecilia's father said during a television interview that he was aware that his daughter had been involved in lesbian relationships. Grunewald would go on to become one of the main witnesses against Cecilia. Both women had originally belonged to the same church, a branch of Lighthouse Full Gospel Church. But between 2010 and 2011, Rhea formed her own group away from the Lighthouse Church called Overcomers Through Christ, or OTC. Grunewald insists that the group was not formed to convert Satanists to Christianity, but the type of courses that were developed by Grunewald say otherwise. Some of the members included Natasha Berger and her neighbor, Joyce Bornsayer. Zach Valentine and his wife Michaela also joined OTC, where they met Cecilia, Marinda, Marcel, and LaRue. By this time, Marinda and her children had moved gradually closer to Cecilia, eventually ending up in the same block of flats as her. In her testimony, Marinda claimed that this was because she liked to visit with Cecilia and found it more convenient to be closer. LaRue claimed that they had moved closer so that they could take care of Cecilia due to her poor health. Whichever the reason, Marinda admitted that she had moved her children to over five different flats in a space of just over a year, each gradually closer to Cecilia. Cecilia, on the other hand, completely denies needing Marinda, or indeed anyone, to take care of her. She claims that she had a domestic worker that came in every day, and anyone that visited her simply did so for social visits. I tend to think that this burgeoning friendship with Marinda probably played a role in the split between Ria Grunewald and Cecilia, although conflicting reasons exist for even this. Ria states that Cecilia was extremely controlling and jealous, and that they had argued over courses that Overcomers Through Christ would be hosting. Pastor Reginald Ben Dixon was Ria's mentor and had become involved in OTC as he was helping Rhea to develop courses, which Cecilia did not agree with. Marinda testified that it was actually Rhea who was the controlling and manipulative one in the relationship. She claims that Rhea did not want anyone near Cecilia, and that if Marinda wanted to visit her, she had to first make sure that Rhea wasn't at her flat. Cecilia, very sparing with the personal details she was willing to share in her testimony, simply said that she and Rhea had ended their relationship and that she was very rude to people who had visited her towards the end of their relationship, even claiming that Rhea would spy on her through her bedroom window. When we get to the list of victims, I think it becomes quite clear who was really controlling of whom, as the first three victims of the series were all very close acquaintances of Rhea Grunewald. By early 2012, Cecilia, Marinda, Zach, Michaela and the Stain children had completely separated themselves from OTC and formed Electus Perdias. Marinda and Cecilia deny that Electus Perdias was a name for the group, even though every member had the same barcode tattoo with the words underneath it. The woman testified that they were just a group of friends, and that there were other people who were part of the friendship group, who weren't on trial. Cecilia said that the name Electus Perdias was just a phrase they came up with during a conversation about how Christians that get tattoos often have the same phrases tattooed, but they wanted something different. LaRue stated that they were instructed to get several tattoos in order to prove their commitment to Cecilia. After the split, it seems that Grunewald had moved on, but Cecilia could not. The anger and resentment that she felt towards Rhea Grunewald was growing within her, and it was about to erupt. Incidents of malicious damage and outright criminality started to occur. A pastor from Lighthouse Church had his car broken into. His church almost burned down, and he was held at gunpoint. Natasha Berger, who had remained with Rhea at OTC, also had her tires slashed. On one occasion, a neighbor reported that someone had knocked on Berger's door. She didn't answer, 
and the next morning she found a large amount of blood outside her door. Homemade bombs were thrown at OTC members' cars. Marcel and LaRue both testified that Miranda and Cecilia had been involved in the manufacture of these bombs and the attacks which they both deny. Miranda scoffed at the idea that she had built these bombs in her flat. She did make reference, however, to having been arrested for these incidents and then being released due to a lack of evidence. But it is unclear whether this was when it had occurred or after the murders, and I found no other reports of this in the media. This must have been extremely frightening for the OTC members, but what they could not know is that this was just a build-up, because the real horror was about to begin. In July 2012, police were called to a brutal double murder in a Centurion security complex. The victims were Natasha Berger, 33, and her neighbor, Joyce Bernzeyer, 68. The woman had both had their throats slit, and the gruesome murder scene was quickly termed by the press to have had satanic links. The reference came from the knowledge that both women had been involved in converting Satanists to Christianity and Natasha had sent an SMS to a friend shortly before her murder, saying, I have said the dangerous prayer. Lord, protect me. Natasha Berger was a lawyer and worked for insurance. Before the OTC split, she had allegedly been tasked with caring for Cecilia. According to Natasha's mother, Cecilia seemed to require constant care. In evidence which would later be led in court, many witnesses stated that Cecilia had, for many years, claimed to be gravely ill. When the split occurred and Natasha decided to continue on with OTC, her mother says that she was not afraid when the threats began as she believed she was protected by God. Natasha Berger was an only child and her murder devastated her elderly parents. Her father became ill after her death and her mother was put on antidepressant medication. Joyce Buernzeyer was Natasha's neighbor and a fellow member of OTC. It would take four years for these murders to be solved. Eventually, in court, the defendants would give varying statements about what had occurred. Marcel Stein, who was just 14 years old when the murders occurred, claims that they were committed by Zach Valentine, with his wife Michaela present. She claimed that Michaela had been unable to bring herself to kill Joyce, so Zach had taken over and killed both women. When LaRue testified about these murders, he claimed that Marinda had also been involved. He said that the group had stalked and followed Natasha Berger for weeks before her murder. He said that in order to incite the group members to murder Natasha, Cecilia had told them that Natasha had said a prayer that somehow caused numerous orphans to die, and this was the reason that Natasha had to be punished. Marinda gave a far more detailed account, denying any involvement from Cecilia. She said that Zach and Michaela had been the ones that wanted Natasha dead. Zach had claimed that Natasha had a chip implanted in her palm in order to give her access to her office building, and the chip had become infected. Doctors had removed it, but he said that Natasha had insisted they reinsert it, and after that, Natasha had changed and become evil, so he wanted to get rid of her. As mentioned, Natasha worked for insurance at the time of her death, and I seriously doubt that they are chipping their employees. Most likely, they would use a fingerprint system to gain access to their building, like many other companies. Marinda said that she believed that it was actually Michaela who wanted Natasha dead, as she was jealous of her. She testified that Zach and Michaela had gone to Natasha's complex, but she was not home. They had gone next door to her elderly neighbor, Joyce Buernzeyer, and told the woman that they wanted to give Natasha a surprise present, and she should leave a note on her door telling her to come to Joyce's unit. They then waited for Natasha to arrive home. Marinda explained that she was told that Michaela was supposed to kill Joyce, but she had only been able to hit her on the head with a hammer once and then ran out to the car, and Zach had killed both women. The mention of the hammer and knife combination being used is interesting, because that would be the weapon of choice that Marinda used going forward as well, although she claimed she had chosen them. Marinda was charged with these two murders as well and pleaded guilty because she had known about them and did not report them to police. Marinda testified that on the evening of the Burger Buenzaya murders, she had been on the way to a parent's evening at the school she worked at, and Zach and Michaela had phoned her and very excitedly told her about the murders. Now, I don't know about you, but if someone phones me and tells me they have just committed a brutal double murder, my first reaction is probably going to be horror and ending the call immediately, but not Miranda. 
Marinda's first reaction was to tell them to make sure they got rid of anything that could link them to the murders, and that she would see them later. That, in my opinion, is the reaction of a seasoned criminal who is part of a very well-thought-out plan, not a humble English teacher who is suddenly thrust into the world of murderers. I also find it interesting that Zach and Michaela would report to her, which adds to the idea that she was coordinating activities. Reginald Ben Dixon was 75 years old at the time of his murder. He was a pastor, singer, writer, and occasional guest speaker at Overcomers Through Christ. Reg was found dead in August 2012. He had been attacked at his home, hacked to death with an axe, and stabbed. Reg was a well-loved member of his community. He was a father, husband, and grandfather. Messages poured in on his Facebook page in the days after his death, lamenting the shocking and barbaric manner in which the elderly pastor had been murdered. Marcel would later testify in court that she had been present on the day Ben Dixon was murdered. Both she and LaRue testified that Cecilia Stain had given Miranda and Zach police officer uniforms which belonged to her husband. They had worn these disguises with wigs when they approached Reg's house. Marcel said that she had followed Marinda and Zach into Reg's house that day. She had heard an exclamation from Reg as Zach hit him with the axe. Marcel then claimed to freeze when she saw her mother on the ground, stabbing Ben Dixon repeatedly. She reported that as they drove away from the house, they had discarded the axe and knife. In Marinda's testimony, she gave a similar account, except according to her, Marcel was not there. She denied that Cecilia had given the instruction to kill Reg and said that she was the one who hated him because she felt that he had changed Rhea and that he was emotionally abusive and stealing Rhea's work to pass off as his own. She also said that the uniforms did not belong to Cecilia's husband to her knowledge. Miranda described arriving at Ben Dixon's house and calling him on his landline to come to the door. She reports that they had spoken to him for some time before Zack initiated the attack by hitting the man on the back of his head with the axe, causing him to fall to the ground. Zack then proceeded to continue hitting Reg with the axe, going into what Miranda describes as a frenzy. She had shouted at him to stop because she wanted to kill Reg, but Zack had continued, so she got onto her knees, lifted Reg's jersey, and started stabbing him repeatedly in the stomach. It was in this portion of the testimony that she would explain how she had essentially blackmailed Zach to help her with the murder of Reg by saying that she would tell on him about Natasha and Joyce's murders if he didn't help her. When she says this, she gives a little self-satisfied smile, like she is so pleased with herself for being so clever and manipulative. She acknowledges, though, that it didn't take much to convince Zach to be involved. Ben Dixon had been Rhea's mentor and friend, and she had always expressed a deep respect for the man. On the day of Rhea's funeral, Rhea Grunewald claims to have received a grisly package on her doorstep. She says it appeared to be a piece of brain tissue, with a note reading, Now you can have your own little piece of Reggie. In court, Miranda was shown the note and denied any knowledge of it. It is unknown as to whether the tissue was DNA-linked back to Ben Dixon. It is this murder which, for me, speaks volumes about the involvement of Cecilia as a mastermind. Although Miranda does her best to claim that she initiated the entire event, the fact that Reg was so important to Rhea has spurned lover written all over it for me. It is of course possible that Miranda had simply taken on these obsessions herself and did indeed decide to murder Reg without prompting. But the note and the grisly package show a disdain towards Rhea, which in my opinion does not reflect the fact that Miranda idolized her, as she claimed, but that Cecilia was rubbing her actions in Rhea's face. Cecilia would also deny any knowledge of this murder, and when questioned about whether she had ever made contact with Rhea during this time to check on her or express any concern considering all these people she knew were dying around her, Cecilia looked at the prosecutor as though he were an idiot and said that she and Rhea were broken up, so there was no reason for her to contact her. On the 4th of October 2012, an estate agent, Estelle Skitter, 
was asked to meet Zach Valentine at his home to conduct a valuation of his property. She would later testify that when she had arrived at the house, Zach was not there, and he had arrived shortly afterwards. They had proceeded into the house through the garage, and Zach had begun to call out to his wife, announcing his arrival. When he received no reply, he began to walk through the house. Skitter had waited in the lounge while Zach went into the bedroom, where she heard him exclaim, Leafy! Oh no! Leafy! Skitter had rushed into the bedroom, finding Zach standing over his wife, who lay in the bed. The room was dark, so Skitter had asked Zach to open the curtains. She saw Michaela Valentine tucked into the bed and covered in stab wounds and blood. Skitter and Valentine fled to the lounge, where he asked her to return to the bedroom to check if his wife was really dead. Skitter would later remark that Zach was strangely calm. He had seemed preoccupied with finding his cats to ensure they were safe, and she noticed that although she was shaking uncontrollably, Zach did not show any physical signs of shock. She had to tell Zach to phone someone, and he decided to phone his dad. Skitter stated that in the moments after finding his wife's body, Zach had continually asked her whether she thought they would be able to still sell the house. Michaela's murder, like the others, would remain unsolved until the group was caught in 2016. I must say that this is strange to me, and I'd like to know whether Ria Grunewald was questioned or came forward as a witness at any stage. She knew all four victims. She clearly understood the link and must have suspected Cecilia was somehow involved. I find it difficult to understand why, for four years, the police were unable to connect the dots back to Cecilia Stain. Perhaps hindsight is twenty twenty, and maybe even Grunewald could not bring herself to believe that Cecilia and the others could be capable of such horrific acts. The details behind the murder would be revealed during the trial, with Marcel claiming that she was present and her mother Mirinda had committed the murder. Cecilia, she says, instructed them to kill Michaela as she had become a loose string. It has been stated that after the first three murders, Michaela had started to pull away from the group, advising Zach that she no longer wanted to be a part of Electus Bedeus. By this time, Zach and Michaela had reportedly given all their money, two million rand, to Cecilia. The money, Zach would later claim, was supposed to go toward an orphanage that Cecilia claimed to be running. This orphanage, which even Cecilia denies any knowledge of, would be a running theme throughout the story, with Cecilia allegedly having used it as an excuse to extort money on many occasions. LaRue would testify that the orphanage was supposedly for the children of people who belonged to a satanic sect which Cecilia had allegedly escaped from. He claimed that she had said that the sect forced their members to sacrifice their firstborn child to pledge allegiance, and many people did not want to do that, so instead they would give up their children to Cecilia's orphanage. Marcel testified that on the night before Michaela's death, Zach administered medicine, presumably sleeping tablets, to her without her knowledge. When Marcel and Marinda arrived at the house the next morning, as arranged, they found Michaela asleep in bed. Marinda approached Michaela and hit her on the head with a hammer. She then put down the hammer and started stabbing her. Marcel says once again that when she saw her mother stabbing Michaela, she just froze. The murder was savage, with police describing the murder scene as extremely gruesome, with blood and pieces of Michaela's internal organs having been cast off the knife onto the ceiling. Marcel then used her own knife, which she had brought with her, and stabbed Michaela's lifeless body once in the side. She claims that she did this because she knew that if they went home and her mother told Cecilia that she did not participate, she would be in trouble. Marcel claims that she had lied to her mother and told her that her knife was blunt so she could not continue stabbing Michaela. During Marinda's testimony, she said that she had parked at a complex further up the road and then walked to Zach and Michaela's complex. She had done this because people in the complex knew her and her car, and she was concerned that someone would see her car parked outside. She said that she had arrived earlier than arranged, and Zach had been leaving from the back entrance while she was entering from the front. They hadn't spoken, but Zach had given her a thumbs-up sign and made a motion to indicate that Michaela was sleeping. Mirinda testified that she had hit Michaela on the head with a hammer, 
and her head bounced up and down on the pillow, and Michaela had woken up and looked at her. It was then that she had leaned down and whispered in her victim's ear the chilling words that she had mentioned in the audio clip I played in the beginning of the episode. Mirinda, ever the stoic, frowned when the prosecutor asked her if she had tucked Michaela in. She has a visceral reaction to this description of a maternal action toward her victim and quickly corrects the prosecutor, stating that she was just trying to make the scene look tidier and she didn't tuck her in. When asked if she had covered Michaela's face with a pillow because she didn't want to see what she had done, she again has a look on her face very similar to disgust and says that the pillow just fell over while she was straightening the covers. It's almost as though she wants it to be very clear to all involved that she has no remorse for her actions and I can only wonder whether that overt display of bravado is for Cecilia's benefit. Mirinda then cleaned the scene of potential evidence and tried to set it up to look like a robbery by taking Michaela's cell phone, purse and wedding ring, which she later dumped. She then went home, changed clothes and watched DVDs. Mirinda denies that Marcel was present at Michaela's murder. Michaela's mother spoke during the trial about the downward spiral she had witnessed in her daughter in the months before her death and while she was a member of the Lectus Perdias. She noticed changes in her daughter after the split occurred in Overcomers Through Christ. Michaela had shaved her head and then grown her hair back and constantly, dramatically changed its color. She no longer laughed and would cry for no apparent reason. She began to scroll Bible verses on the walls of the home that she and Zach shared. Then, a week before her death, Michaela had asked her mother if she knew a lawyer because people from the ministry were dying and she was afraid. Describing the last time she saw her daughter, Michaela's mother that said that she seemed lighter and happier. I wonder if Zach hadn't perhaps persuaded Michaela that they could both leave the group in an effort to lull her into a false sense of security. With Michaela's mother's admissions, I once again find it odd that Michaela's murder was not traced back to Electus Perdias almost immediately. Could the robbery ruse really have been that convincing? Michaela's murder would bring the 2012 series to an end. If I look at the manner in which victims were killed and the quick succession of events, I sense that there was a significant amount of emotion involved. Although evidence led in trial states that Cecilia Stain did not physically kill any of the victims, I cannot help but feel that her hatred for Ria Grunewald and those involved in the Overcomers Through Christ movement was a significant instigator behind the crimes. These were murders that involved a huge amount of overkill, which is usually indicative of rage and often a personal connection with the victim. I find it very interesting that Cecilia was able to, so adeptly, transfer her own hatred for these victims to her followers in such a way that they would carry out these crimes as though they had personally been wronged. LaRue Stain testified in court that after Michaela's murder, the group had decided to hit Ria Grunewald closer to home, and a detailed plan began to emerge to murder Ria's son, Joshua. A friend of Zach Valentine was recruited to take part in the murder, but when this friend suddenly disappeared, Cecilia became concerned that he had gone to the police, and the group shelved the plan and decided to lay low for a while. While I've been unable to ascertain the exact ages of Rhea's children at the time of these events, from some pieces of information, I gather that they were still minors, which means that, chillingly, Cecilia and her followers would have had no problem killing a child. The decision taken to lay low turned into a hiatus, which allegedly lasted for three years. LaRue Stain claims that the group returned to murdering because their money began to run low, but I must say that I find it difficult to believe that the group did not commit any crimes in that three-year period. Considering the unusual dynamic at play here, with so many different personalities, it would not have been easy to keep them all in check for that long. Perhaps this is just another testament to Cecilia's strength of manipulative power, or maybe there are victims out there that have yet to be discovered. Miranda testified in court that Cecilia's health had started to decline dramatically approximately two years before their arrest, so possibly the need for money was related to Cecilia's medical bills. 
Either way, in November 2015, Electus Pedias returned with a vengeance. By now, they had added John Barnard to the group, and he was living with Marinda at 17 Kosana Flats, while Marcel and LaRue lived with Cecilia at number one. It is unknown whether there was a romantic relationship between Marinda and John, and unfortunately I was not able to find any footage of John Barnard's testimony. But a very interesting and disturbing question was posed to Marinda during her testimony. The prosecutor asked Marinda if it was true that her daughter Marcel had spent a lot of time in John Barnard's bed. Marinda looked stunned for a moment and then barked out, No! Then thought for a second and ended with, I hope not. Marcel would have been a minor. And if something untowards was happening with Barnard, one would think that he would have faced charges relating to it, unless Marcel denied the allegations and the prosecutor did not think it necessary to charge him. It was never explained why the children were living with Cecilia in her flat and Marinda was living with Barnard. And while I would like to say this is strange, it pales in comparison with most other aspects of this case. With money now being the predominant motivator in victim selection, John Barnard would point out the group's next targets. Joan Mayer, 47, and Peter Mayer, 51, had been John Barnard's employers for several years. The entrepreneurial couple owned a printing business, Color Magic Print, in Robertville, Johannesburg, where John worked as a printing machine operator. The Mayers also owned a mattress factory in Shamdor, Johannesburg, and had recently purchased a large plot of land in KwaZulu-Natal, where they planned to build the largest water park in South Africa. The couple was described as hard-working and Peter as a fantastic friend. On the 27th of November 2015, police and community watch members were called to the mayor's home in Rudd Street, Nootheerville. The couple had been found, beaten and stabbed to death in their home. There was no forced entry, and the only items taken were two cell phones, a small amount of cash, and a remote for the gate of the home. Speculation started to fly on social media, with many claiming that the murders were as a result of a business deal gone wrong. The truth would be revealed the following year, after the arrest of Electus Perdias members and the subsequent trial. John Barnard had convinced the group that the mayors had millions of rands in a safe in their house. A ruse was created by Marinda and Zach, in which they posed as crooked employees from the Department of Trade and Industry. They claimed that they could organize a 5 million rand investment into the mayor's water park project, and Marinda would get a 1 million rand commission as part of the deal. Marinda called herself Gloria, and she and Zach met with Peter Mayer twice before the murders occurred but she claimed that they had never planned to kill the mayors. They just wanted to rob them of the cash that John claimed they had in the safe. Once again, defendants gave varying accounts of what happened that night, as well as who was present. Marinda stated that she and Zach had been sitting at a table with the mayors, with no one else present, when she commented to Peter that there was no smell of food in the house, as there had been on a previous occasion. Peter stated that as it was Friday night, their son had just gone to get some takeaways for them. Realizing that they may be caught red-handed if they didn't act soon, Marinda gave Zach the signal, and the robbery got underway. She had stood up and produced the gun she had hidden in her pants, saying that the deal wasn't going to work for her and that they were going to be robbed. Zach produced a large knife, which he threatened the mayors with, as Marinda cable-tied their hands and feet and put tape over their mouths. Marinda would state that the tape on Peter's mouth kept coming off, and he kept talking to Zach, even though he was told not to. Marinda searched Peter's pockets and found what appeared to be a key to a safe. She said that Zach had then surprised her by suddenly snapping and starting to stab the mayors repeatedly. She said that Zach's behavior was so sudden and wild that she was afraid of him that night. She once again describes herself as being the one in control by saying that Zach was running around like a headless chicken from room to room, occasionally running back to make sure the mayors were dead. Marinda says that in contrast, she went upstairs as she figured that this would be the, where the safe was and methodically moved through the upper level looking for the safe. It is unclear at this point whether they found nothing or whether they found a safe and it was empty, but they both realized that the millions were nowhere to be found and decided to leave. 
Marinda removed the cable ties from the deceased mayors, as she thought her DNA could be on them, and they left the scene, dumping the murder weapons out the window as they drove, in Marinda's words, stupidly, like Hansel and Gretel, leaving a trail of breadcrumbs. Something that I find quite reprehensible about Marinda, well, besides the fact that she's a cold-blooded murderer, is that she makes disparaging comments about her victims while testifying. About the Mayers, she'd said that the ruse that they had concocted worked well because Peter Mayer was driven by his greed. One would think that she would want to spare the victims' families from hearing their murderer insult them, but Marinda seems to enjoy minimizing her victims' existence. Marinda testified that LaRue was supposed to accompany them to the mayor's, but when he'd been packing his guns to prepare for the robbery, he dropped one, and it had gone off and accidentally shot him in the upper thigh. In a completely sickening move, Marinda decided that she wasn't willing to postpone the mayor's robbery, so while her son lay in hospital with a serious gunshot wound, she proceeded with her plan as though nothing had happened. Cecilia would testify that LaRue had told her he had been mugged and shot. He spent a week in the hospital. Another interesting question was posed by the prosecutor in this section of the trial, which once again pointed to Miranda possibly not having the control over others that she thought she did. The prosecutor asked Miranda whether she was aware that Zach had conducted his own meeting with the mayors and taken LaRue along. Surprised and clearly a little put out by the revelation, Miranda curtly replied that she had no idea that happened. It appears that Marcel had testified to being present at the murders, saying that Zack and Miranda had collected her from school and they had gone to the mayor's house. Marcel testified that when Zack had been stabbing Peter Mayer, the victim had begun to recite Psalm 23 out loud. She and Zack had gone gambling with 700 rand they had stolen from the Mayers. John Barnard now disgraced within the group at having led them astray with his plan to rob the mayors, quickly hatched a new plot to get funds for the group. A life insurance policy was taken out with Discovery Life for 3.5 million rand against the life of Zach Valentine, and soon the group set about faking his death. Jared Jackson was a 44-year-old man who was recovering from drug abuse and attempting to get his life back on track, along with his partner, Candace Ellison. Jared was selling snacks on a street corner near Kasana Flats, and it is unclear how the couple came to know the members of Electus Perdias, but it has been acknowledged that they both knew at least Cecilia and Zach. Jared's partner Candace was pregnant with Jared's child when Zach Valentine decided that Jared looked just enough like him to be used in his plan. He picked Jared up, saying he wanted to take him for a drive. In his testimony, LaRue Stain admitted that he had crushed sleeping tablets, which Cecilia had given him, and mixed them with fruit juice, which he gave to Jared while they were in the BMW, driven by Zach. Miranda and John had followed in the Mercedes-Benz SLK. When Jared fell asleep near Pietra Stain in the Free State, they had pulled over, and LaRue had strangled Jared to death. They then placed his body in the SLK, poured paraffin in and around the car and on the body, and set it alight. They all returned to Krugersdorp in the BMW. The idea was to make it look like Zach had died in a car accident on his way to the Free State for the weekend. When Jared did not return home that night, Candace had phoned Cecilia and asked her if she knew where Jared was or if she had seen Zach. Cecilia told Candace that Jared had never gone with Zach, and the last time she had seen him was on the street outside her flat. She then told Candace that Zach had been in a car accident, and for some inexplicable reason told her he was in a coma. In the week following the murder, Miranda and Cecilia's brother-in-law drove to Pietra Stain to identify Zach's body. Miranda presented herself as Zach's sister. Discovery Life went to Pietrastain to investigate the accident, and they were told by the police not to pay out the claim, as the blood type of the deceased differed from Zach Valentine. The claim, in which Cecilia was named the beneficiary, was never paid out. Cecilia claimed to have no knowledge of Zach's death being faked, and said that she had no idea why she was made his beneficiary. 
Despite the inconsistencies found in the investigation, a death certificate was issued, and for all intents and purposes, Zach Valentine was now dead. I found it extremely disturbing to see friends and family having posted messages of mourning and condolence on Zach's social media accounts during this time. His own family had still thought that he was dead until the day of his arrest in 2016. Family members who attended his bail hearing were heard to utter that they had goosebumps when they saw the man that they had buried and mourned walk into the courtroom. I cannot begin to understand how you could forgive someone for doing that to you, especially since the ploy was born solely of greed. Another of John Barnard's insane schemes had run aground, and yet another needed to be hatched. The group were quickly running out of money and becoming desperate. The new year dawned with a new tactic from the group to get money. From now on, they selected victims they did not know and chose professionals whose ordinary course of work would involve making appointments with strangers. Glenn McGregor was 57 years old and a self-employed accountant who lived in Krugersdorp. Once again, the testimonies differ, but Marcel testified that Marinda had made an appointment with Glenn, saying that she needed help with her taxes. Marcel, Marinda and LaRue attended the appointments at Glenn's home and it has been reported that Marinda shot Glenn in the stomach and then transferred 6,000 rand into her bank account before LaRue ended Glenn's life by strangling him. They then dumped his body into a bath filled with water. In Marinda's version, she and LaRue were alone at Glenn's house. After she had shot Glenn, he was laying on the floor in pain. Marinda admitted to giving him false hope by telling him that there was still time for her to call an ambulance if he gave her the pin to his cell phone banking. She said that Glenn had tried to give her an incorrect pin, but in his pain and distress had accidentally blurted out the right number first. In a very sick twist, she put the reference on the payments as sexy time. She claimed that she'd been in a panic and thought of that as something that he would be paying her for, because in her words, I could see he was quite a perverted man with the stuff he had laying around his house and I heard that he was like that. I am continually amazed at this woman's utter disdain for her innocent victims. She is a multiple murderer but still thinks that she has the right to judge other people's sexual tastes. Miranda was asked whether the water in the bath was hot or cold and she said that she wasn't sure, but probably hot, as that would be the best to destroy evidence. The prosecutor then asked her to confirm whether Glenn was actually dead when they had placed him in the hot water. Miranda stated that she had thought that he had died when LaRue strangled him, but in court, the pathologist had testified that he had died of the gunshot wounds, so now she wasn't sure. She then admitted if he had bled out, it was possible that he was still alive when they put him in the bath. Although the group would be arrested later in the same year, it wasn't until several more victims had lost their lives, and I find it, once again, very strange that a connection was not made to Miranda almost immediately by the police, considering she used a bank account in her own name to receive the stolen funds. The body of 64-year-old insurance broker Anthony Schofield was found in the boots of his abandoned vehicle in May 2016. His body was wrapped in black plastic, there were injuries to his head and his cause of death was determined to be strangulation. As both this victim and the next worked in the insurance industry, I cannot help but wonder whether Zach was somehow involved in selecting these victims as he had worked in the same industry prior to his fake death. The details surrounding Schofield's murder would be described by LaRue in his testimony. He stated that they had initially made an appointment with Schofield to meet at the Key West shopping center in Krugersdorp. Shortly before the appointment time, they had called the victim to ask if he would rather come to their home at Kasana Flats. LaRue says that they did this to avoid a trail. When professional people make appointments, they will generally put the address in an electronic diary or on a notepad. By changing the meeting points at the last minute, LaRue said that they hoped to disguise the deceased's last movements. LaRue met Anthony at his car and took him upstairs to their flat, where Marinda offered him coffee. Once the victim was inside, seated, and the front door was locked, Marinda had drawn a 38 caliber revolver and told Schofield to lay down on the floor. LaRue cable tied him and forced him to give them his bank account pin. Marcel and John took Anthony's PIN number and bank card and successfully drew money from his account. Marcel would later state 
that in both the Schofield and McAlpine murders, she would phone her brother and mother to tell them that she had successfully drawn money so that they could kill the victims. By the time she got back to the flat, LaRue had strangled Anthony Schofield to death. LaRue alleges that Cecilia used some of the money stolen from Anthony to buy a red and black jacket, which she had worn to court. Miranda claimed that she had no knowledge of Marcel being involved in drawing the money from the victim's accounts. She claimed that, to her knowledge, it was always either John Barnard or LaRue who had gone to draw money at the ATM. On being asked how they had got the bodies of their three 2016 victims down the stairs of the flats and into their cars, Miranda had explained that they had used one of the dustbins on wheels to transport the bodies. They would pull the victims' vehicles into the parking area behind the flats and load the bodies into the boot of the cars. They then drove Anthony's car to a primary school nearby and abandoned it there. Anthony's wife Heather cried in court as LaRue described murdering her husband. Kevin McAlpine was just 29 years old at the time of his murder. He had been married for just over a year to his wife Kizia and she was seven months pregnant with their first child. It is heartbreaking to read Kevin's social media posts in the months leading up to his murder. He posts loving messages to his wife, expressing his happiness and excitement at their future together. It was a future that would be snatched away by Electus Padias for their own selfish and insignificant gain. Kizia gave birth to Kevin's son two months after his death, and I cannot imagine the horrible mixture of joy and grief that must have tinged that moment. Kevin's murder was almost identical to Anthony Schofield's in strategy. LaRue explained that they had lured him and killed him in the same way, with Marcel and John once again drawing money from the victim's account in the moments before his death. LaRue stated that once Kevin was dead, they had gone downstairs to call Cecilia from her flat, and she had come upstairs and kicked Kevin's body. They then wrapped Kevin in black plastic sheeting and placed him in the boot of his car, which they abandoned in Sivarite Street's Krugersdorp. The street is well known for criminal activity, and Kevin's vehicle was stolen shortly after it was abandoned and later recovered with his body still in the boot. In a television interview, Kizia McAlpine described finding out about the fate of her husband. After he was reported missing, she had waited at their new home for a call from police. When it came, the detective had said that they had found Kevin's car and there was a body in the boot, but they needed to identify it. They asked Kizia to send a photograph of Kevin to the detective's phone. She did so and waited on the line. She says that she got the impression that the detective was stalling and didn't want to tell her that it was Kevin because she was in advanced pregnancy and he was worried that something would happen to her. In a heart-rending description of being overcome with fear, Kizia describes going to hide behind the couch, thinking through her fog of devastation that if no one could find her, then they wouldn't be able to tell her that Kevin was dead. She would eventually overhear the detective telling someone in the background that it was indeed Kevin in the boot. After sentencing, she would state that she had come to realize that it didn't matter what type of sentence the accused got, because it wouldn't bring back her husband, nor give their son Daniel the opportunity to meet his father. The group's final victim was Krugersdorp estate agent Hanli Lotachan. Hanli was 52 years old at the time of her murder. She and her husband Andre had been married for 33 years before divorcing and then remarrying again. At the time of her death, they had been remarried for three months. Her first grandson was born a few months after her murder. Sadly, Hanli would never get the chance to enjoy the wonderful occasion. On the day of Hundley's murder, her husband testified that he had received an SMS notification that 3,000 Rand had been withdrawn from his account. He immediately tried calling Hundley, and her phone rang and then went to voicemail. He then received several more SMS notifications that there were insufficient funds in his account. This indicated that someone was continually trying to withdraw money, and he instinctively knew that this was not Hundley. Marcel Stein would later confirm that she tried to make withdrawals, but kept getting an error notification that she did not recognize. She returned to the flats, she claims, 
thinking Hanley had given her an incorrect pin, but Hanley had already been killed. Marcel does not mention at any time that she was able to withdraw 3,000 rand from the bank account. Hanley Latigan was strangled at Kosana Flats, and her body was dumped near a stream in Renfontein, where it was found the next day by a group of schoolchildren. CCTV from the hospital across the road from Kosana Flats had caught Marinda coming down to Hanley's car to meet her, and the pair proceeding into the flats together. Marinda would testify that while she waited for LaRue to come back from drawing money from Hanley's account, the woman had spoken to her, and she had assured Hanley that they were not going to hurt her. Marinda denied Marcel's involvement in the murder as she had consistently done to that point. Her testimony to that effect would be completely blown out of the water though, when it was revealed that police had found photographs on Marcel's cell phone of Hanli Latigan cable tied to a chair. LaRue Stain testified that after this murder, Cecilia had insisted he take out a life insurance policy in his name. He had refused, as he believed that, unlike Zach Valentine's fake death, his own would be very real. The addition of a third victim to the 2016 series and the similarity between the murders sparked an uproar in the Krugersdorp community, who demanded the killers be brought to justice before another professional lost their life. Police eventually started to pick up the trail, and by June 2016, they were ready to make arrests. Initially, though, it would not be whom we would assume. Time was not on the side of Electus Perdias, and the police were very quickly gaining ground in their investigation, which centered around the three murders that had occurred in Krugersdorp in 2016, which they had linked together. Arrests were imminent, but the identity of those arrested will be surprising, although at that time no one knew any different. In June 2016, Christian Kruger, 28, and Fabian Luff, 32, were arrested for the three most recent murders. If you're about to start backtracking this episode, thinking you must have missed the discussion of these role players, don't. I haven't discussed these two young men yet, because although there seems to be some link between them and the Stain children, they are not members of Electus Bodeus. Police linked the two Krugersdorp residents to one of the victims through cell phone records, and while it is certainly suspicious, there was seemingly no other evidence tying the men to the murders. They were released, and all charges dismissed, four months later. For four months, though, these two were painted as horrendous murderers and then based it in the press and on social media. A harsh reminder to all that we should always keep in mind that people are innocent until proven guilty. I mentioned that there must be some sort of link between them and the Stain children, because shortly after the arrest of Kruger and Luff, police arrested Marcel and LaRue Stain. It then came to light that a man arrested for fraud and identity theft charges in April 2016, who was still in custody, was in fact Zach Valentine. He was living under a new identity of Jacques de Villiers, and often introduced himself as Michael de Villiers. The investigation revealed that he too was involved in the Electus Perdias group. In July, Miranda Stain and Cecilia Stain were arrested. It is unclear when John Barnard was arrested, but by October 2016, he too was in custody. As mentioned previously, Zach Valentine's family found out for the first time when he was arrested that he had actually not been dead for the last year. Zach, in my opinion, has treated the entire process with disdain. Besides continually giving strange grins to photographers, he appeared at his bail hearing stating that he had a job offer that he would miss out on if the judge did not grant him bail. The judge ruled that considering the job offer was made to him under a fake identity, he was certain the organization would retract the offer on discovering his true identity. In a frightening twist, it turned out that Zach had applied for and been offered a position at a homeless shelter. The judge noted that considering he was charged with the murder of a down-and-out individual, it would be extremely risky to place him in that environment while on bail. I think that this is putting it mildly. I firmly believe that Zach had absolutely no desire to assist the homeless, and that this job would simply be another way to gain access to vulnerable people that he and Electus Pedias could manipulate for their own devious ends. His arrest could not have been timelier. Marcel and LaRue were berated by the judge during their bail hearing for laughing when evidence was led that police had found the photographs of Hanli Latigan on Marcel's cell phone. Shortly before Marinda's arrest, she was approached to be interviewed by a local magazine. 
At this time, she was simply seen as a concerned mother, whose children were accused of heinous acts. She could have easily declined the interview, as most people in this situation would do, but in a move which showed her absolute narcissism and desire for attention, she accepted. Miranda met with the reporter and launched into a tirade about how shocked she was that her children had been accused of the murders. She described her son and daughter in loving terms, even bringing with her a collection of soft toys that LaRue had allegedly purchased for her just because he loves his mom. I don't think I need to get into how absolutely twisted this is. It is darkly amusing to see the difference in how the accused looked when they were initially arrested and their appearance during the trial. I understand that defense attorneys are simply doing their jobs, but it is wildly clear that the defendants had been coached in how to alter their image to provide a different impression to the public. Miranda went from wearing a beanie, pulled down over long, dark, dirty hair, and looking like she could pull a knife on you at any minute, to wearing matching suits and her hair clean and shoulders length in curls like an ordinary mom. Laughing Marcel, who appears cocky in early photographs, also took to wearing suits and collared shirts and hanging her head in shame in photographs. LaRue's long beard was neatly trimmed and Cecilia went from arrogant and self-assured to walking around with an oxygen pipe under her nose. It is only Zach Valentine who shows no marked difference in appearance, but I can only imagine the heated discussions he had with his counsel, undoubtedly telling him to stop smiling at photographers. None of the group was granted bail. After the arrests, the group began to split, and while for some, loyalty went out the door, Others decided to try and make a last-ditch attempt to save other group members. The first group member to accept a plea deal was John Barnard. He pleaded guilty to five charges of murder, five charges of robbery with aggravating circumstances, fraud, defeating or obstructing the administration of justice, and for failing to report the location of a firearm and ammunition. He was sentenced to 30 years in jail, with 10 years suspended if he agreed to testify against the rest of the group. It would be revealed that Barnard's cell phone activity had been crucial evidence in the case, as he had been the only one of the group to take his cell phone with him and leave it switched on throughout each crime he was present at. Police used this to track his movements with cell phone tower triangulation. Miranda Stain also accepted a plea deal early on and was sentenced to 11 life terms for the murder charges and racketeering. She was also sentenced to 115 years for various charges including robbery, fraud, accessory after the fact, unlawful possession of a firearm and unlawful possession of ammunition. Her plea deal was also on the condition that she testify against her fellow accused. She would use this deal, however, to claim that Cecilia was completely unaware of any of the murders. I can't really say what sort of deal this was, though, as whether she had taken it or agreed to go through a trial, there is no doubt she would have spent the rest of her life in jail anyway. I could be wrong, but I almost feel like this is another manipulation by Cecilia. Not in person, of course. I'm sure Miranda would have known that the only way she could avoid revealing all the details would be to plead guilty, and once again, twist the situation to suit her as much as possible. Miranda would, of course, also use her testimony to try and absolve Marcel of any guilt, while she seemed to have absolutely no problem throwing her son, LaRue, under the bus. When asked by the judge whether there was anything she would like to say as he considers her sentence, Miranda stated, One has choices, and one has to accept the consequences. LaRue Stain also pleaded guilty and received a 25-year sentence for murder, robbery, and racketeering. LaRue stated that he did not mind going to jail as he felt safe there. This is a very odd statement to make and perhaps speaks to the disruptive formative years he experienced. It may also be a reference to the fear he claims to have felt for his own life while living with Cecilia. A strange side story would develop at this time around LaRue. A female reporter for a local magazine was alleged to have developed an improper relationship with the young murder accused. The woman, who was married with a young daughter at the time, was suspended from her job. It is unclear whether she was eventually dismissed or whether she resigned, but she no longer works for that publication and appears to have separated from her husband. The woman has stated that she will be releasing a book in the near future about the Krugersdorp killers. There is no evidence to prove whether this claim was in fact true, but I mention it to indicate all of the strange twists and turns that this case has taken. 
the articles written by this reporter were among the most detailed and well-written that I have come across in my research. Marinda would continuously claim that LaRue was lying throughout most of his testimony. She stated that she believed that his motive for trying to get Cecilia and his sister into trouble was jealousy. Marinda agreed that she and Cecilia had treated Marcel very differently from LaRue, but claimed that this was based on their behavior. She described LaRue as having been difficult and manipulative, even as a young child, and she says that she feels guilty for having made him into the person he is today by covering up his lies and manipulations when he was a child. I wonder whether she has considered that the way LaRue turned out probably has far more to do with the fact that she brought him into a murderous gang of reprobates than any mistake she may have made while he was growing up. I'm sure this would be a stretch too far for her narcissistic brain to admit, though. When Marinda was arrested at the school at which she worked, she asked officers if she could draw up a will in their presence, and one of her co-workers served as witness. In this document, she disowned both her children and left all of her worldly belongings to Cecilia Stone. The detective on the case showed this document to LaRue, and when he read it, he reportedly flew into a rage and told the detective that he was now going to tell the truth and his mother would suffer for what she had done. Zach Valentine, Cecilia Stane, and Marcel Stane decided to take their chances at trial, with the latter initially claiming to have not been involved in any of the crimes, but later deciding to admit to her involvement. Some of the most revealing information in the trial was led around the character and past of alleged group leader Cecilia Stane. Ria Kronenwald had stated that she had actually did not want to testify, as she was afraid that Cecilia had something on her. She claims that during the early years of the group forming, when she was still involved in Cecilia's life, she was aware that Cecilia would invite students to her home, ply them with alcohol, and then film them without their knowledge. She claims that this is how Cecilia blackmailed people to join the group. I wonder whether police have ever been able to confirm the existence of such footage, as it would certainly point to the existence of other members. Grunewald had been concerned that perhaps Cecilia had footage of her. Rhea also testified about the early days of knowing Cecilia and how she had cared for her day and night, missing out on seeing her own children to act as a mother to Cecilia. When she met Cecilia in 2007, the woman had claimed that she was a reformed Satanist and that she had committed murders while she belonged to a Satanic cult. Knowing what we now know about Cecilia, I wonder whether this could be true. Rhea explained that due to Cecilia's previous satanic involvement, she and some OTC members would have to gather at Cecilia's flat on nights when Cecilia claimed she could sense her previous satanic cult was sacrificing people. On these nights, they would have to pray to stop Cecilia's soul from being stolen out of her body. Rhea would have to put oil on her hands and place them between Cecilia's legs to prevent her from being raped by demons. Rhea says that she was drawn to Cecilia because she was very humble and subdued. She saw her as a hurt human being in great pain and distress. Cecilia had claimed to possess supernatural powers, and as Rhea's role was to help reform Satanists, she wanted to care for Cecilia and help her recover from her past. Rhea says that she now realizes that she was deceived by Cecilia and manipulated. She also denies Cecilia's claims that they had a sexual relationship. Another friend of Cecilia's, Candace Rijevic, testified in court that Cecilia's claims of having supernatural powers had been a long-running theme. Rijevic stated that Cecilia had claimed to be able to walk on water, turn into a wolf, make things appear and disappear, and see whether people were pure or if they had demons in them. She'd also claimed to be a psychologist and was reported to speak in other voices, including that of children. When Cecilia was married, she had reported to friends that she believed her father was astral projecting to rape her through her husband and that her father was sending demons to rape her at night. The other side of Cecilia, around which much testimony was led, was her mental illness. Cecilia admitted to suffering from agoraphobia, which is an anxiety disorder that causes a fear of situations or places which may trigger panic. Sufferers are often confined to their homes for long periods. Cecilia explained that because she was so ill and could easily have an asthma attack at any time, she had restricted herself to a specific circumference around Kasana Flats, and if she ventured outside of those boundaries, it would trigger a panic attack. 
She also testified, as discussed earlier, that she had been diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder, or DID. DID is formerly known as multiple personality syndrome and usually occurs when an individual has suffered severe trauma very early in life. As a coping mechanism, the personality will dissociate into various fragments of the whole. Contrary to popular belief, these are not personalities in addition to the main personality, but rather parts of it. Therapy for the disorder therefore involves recombining the fragments of the personality so that they can once again function as one unit. Cecilia claimed to only be able to talk about two other personality fragments within her, named Akisha and Anya. The latter, according to Cecilia, is a three-year-old girl and the former is dangerous. She said that these beings, as she refers to them, control her thoughts and actions. Marinda would testify that she could tell when one of Cecilia's other personality fragments had taken over because she would wear her cap in different ways, depending on who was in control. She would also speak differently and use different words. Marinda claimed that she would often tell Cecilia something, only for her to deny knowledge of it later. Marinda would then realize that she had been talking to a different personality fragment. The symptom of DID that Marinda is referring to here is called dissociative fugue state. This is when a person with DID changes personality fragments and one does not remember what the other has done. So the prominent personality will experience a sense of having lost time. I began to wonder whether Cecilia's DID and the fugue states could have played a role in her orchestrating the murders and claiming to have no knowledge of them. So I did a bit of research into other criminals with DID who had committed murders. In 1979 in the U.S., a hotel maid named Juanita Maxwell beat a 73-year-old guest to death with a bedside lamp. She claimed to have no memory of committing the crime, but also could not remember any of the hours after the guest had entered the hotel and they had a disagreement in the lobby. In court, Juanita Maxwell's attorney carefully coaxed out her other personality fragment, Wanda Weston, who admitted to the murder quite happily. Juanita was found not guilty on the basis of insanity and committed to a mental institution. A DID patient recorded in the latter part of the 19th century was found to have 10 different personality fragments, each of which had their own physical ailments, from paralysis to epilepsy. These personality fragments had such great control over the patient's body that when each emerged, he would physically take on these ailments by becoming completely paralyzed at times and then recovering from his paralysis but having regular epileptic fits. I can assure you that I am in no way trying to say that Cecilia is somehow less guilty because she suffers from DID. These murders happened over such a long period of time that I cannot believe that her dominant personality would not have witnessed some evidence of them at some stage. It is interesting to consider, though, that perhaps one of her personality fragments was more responsible for the retribution murders than another, and also that a fugue state could be an explanation for her story being completely opposite to that of many of the others. It also makes me wonder whether one of the personality fragments was responsible for all the stories about her supernatural powers. Despite any mental health issues she was experiencing, Cecilia showed an adept talent for willfully manipulating people throughout her life. Her friend Candace testified that Cecilia would cut off the tips of latex gloves and fill them with her own blood and tie them closed. She would then keep these in her mouth, and when in company, she would start to retch and act as though she was having a seizure, bite into the blood-filled capsules, and pretend to have vomited up blood. This was one of the ways she managed to convince people that she was gravely ill. Candace claims to have given Cecilia up to 100,000 rand a month to assist her with her health problems. She also claimed to be the bride of Satan and a 42nd generation witch. Marcel Stein had stated in her testimony that while she had been involved in some of the crimes, she had only done so because she was afraid for her life. Marcel claims, and this has been confirmed by LaRue, that she had run away from home once in an attempt to get away from the group. She had walked the entire night, but claimed that eventually she had to return home because she had nowhere else to go. 
Marcel claims that she was controlled by her mother and Cecilia and barely allowed to leave the house except to go to school. She says that her mother had made outright death threats against her, saying that if she ever tried to leave, she would get the same treatment Michaela had received. Cecilia had told Marcel when she was 13 that they both had a demon inside them that caused them to not feel compassion or empathy toward other people. Marcel found this strange as she felt like a normal person, but she liked that she had something in common with Cecilia, who she looked up to and admired. Marcel Stein, in my opinion, is a bit of a conundrum. Granted, she was very young when the murders took place, and it is certainly easier to manipulate a young person than an adult. Marcel comes across as introverted and studious, and she is no doubt highly intelligent. Some of the acts she witnessed, though, would have been scarring and traumatic, but she continued to involve herself. She was 13 years old when she witnessed a woman she claimed to care about, Michaela Valentine, be brutally murdered by her own mother. She even stabbed Michaela herself. I do think that Marcel's continued involvement has a lot to do with her mother and brother also being involved. I found some interesting posts on Marcel's social media accounts. In October 2015, just two months before she would help to murder Glenn McGregor, she posted, If at first you don't succeed, try doing it the way mom told you in the first place. The dark irony of those words now is sadly evident. On the 7th of December that same year, she posted a quote by Edgar Allan Poe, The scariest monsters lurk within our own souls. Marcel may have been placed in a situation she didn't choose, but I believe that the willingness existed inside her to take part, whatever her reason may have been. Marinda Stein was desperately attached to Cecilia, and through her testimony, it seems the woman still has a hold over her. Marinda has tried to claim that she was the leader of the group, and that Cecilia had no role in any of the crimes. She's also tried to claim that Marcel was not involved. Marinda was well respected by the teachers she worked with, but this reportedly changed when police found ammunition hidden in Marinda's classroom. By all accounts, she did an excellent job of maintaining the respectable teacher and mother image she had built up over the years, and not a single person was aware of her behind-the-scenes activities. Marinda seems to have an extremely complicated relationship with her children. She involved them in some horrendous circumstances and allegedly threatened their lives, but then tried to protect her daughter from conviction in her testimony. Zach Valentine's actions, in my opinion, have been nothing but cold-hearted and cruel. In the months after Michaela Valentine's death, her parents posted on his Facebook page saying that they loved him and they still saw him as their son-in-law. Michaela's father expressed his condolences and thanked Zach for loving his daughter and taking care of her, saying that Zach was the best thing that had ever happened to Michaela. During the trial, Michaela's mother expressed absolute devastation at discovering that her beloved son-in-law was accused of being involved in her daughter's murder. She, along with so many others, had mourned him when he had supposedly died. Michaela's messages to her husband on his Facebook page in the months before she died expressed a love and devotion of which Zach proved himself completely unworthy. LaRue had claimed that his mother had tried to keep him and his sister away from their father, but then when he was 18, he formed a relationship with his dad. It emerged during LaRue's testimony that there had been a plot, instigated by Miranda, to kill his father. His father is severely allergic to bees, and Miranda had planned to inject him with bee venom. The plan was eventually shelved. Miranda and the children's father divorced when they were eight and six years old, respectively. Their father remarried soon after, and their stepmother, now divorced from their father, spoke to a local magazine during the trial. She described LaRue and Marcel as being sweet, well-mannered children. They appear to have spent a good amount of time with their father initially, by the stepmother's account, and she described collecting them from the flat in Krugersdorp to spend weekends with them. This soon tapered off, though, as Marinda laid down stricter rules around the visitations, and eventually the children were not allowed to see their father at all. I can only think that Marinda did this on purpose, as she became more involved in Electus Pedias, isolating her children would lessen the chance that they would be able to tell anyone what was happening. The stepmother claims that when LaRue was around 17 or 18, 
Marinda had contacted them saying that LaRue had been caught smoking at school and that she was going to send him to live with them because she couldn't handle him anymore. That never happened and I doubt that Marinda would have taken that risk. It emerged around that time that Marinda had hired a separate flat in a different block for LaRue. To wrap up what has been a long and very complex case to research, I wanted to address two questions that have been at the forefront of my mind while researching this case. The first is, can we call Electus Pedias a cult? And the second is, can we classify any of its members as serial killers? While the press is bandied around the term cult quite frequently in this case, I'm not convinced that it really is one. Judge Elam Jacob Francis has only ever referred to Electus Pedias as an enterprise. He compared it to a business, with Cecilia being the CEO, Marinda the manager, and the other members as foot soldiers. In my opinion, the judge does this because using the term cult could be a slippery slope in legal terms. Our democracy protects our right to religious expression, although in the exercising of those rights you cannot be found to infringe on others' rights. Judge Francis did refer to the group as religious in nature and expressed that he felt the case showed the danger that could be posed by a manipulative religious leader. In essence, there's nothing wrong with the beliefs held by Electus Perdias, although they actually didn't seem to have a very clear religious philosophy behind them. It seems to come down to whatever Cecilia said was the truth was accepted as such. Rick Ross in The Guardian says, quote, A typical cult has a charismatic, unaccountable, accountable leader, persuades by coercion, exploits its members economically, sexually, or in some other way, end quote. Every element of that definition explains what was happening in this group. Throughout the trial, Cecilia was referred to as being the type of person that others are drawn to. What bugs me about Electris Perdias in a cult context is the shift in motive. Had they continued to kill people with whom Cecilia had personal issues, I could have bought the cult theory wholesale. They didn't though. They went into a supposed hiatus for three years and then switched to killing strangers for money. There's no doubt that the members were exploited. Marinda was willing to kill her own children, or so LaRue and Marcel claimed, if they turned on the group. Zach Valentine gave every cent he owned to Cecilia. While I think that the thing that originally bound these people together was religion, there was no overriding philosophy that kept them together for five years. In my opinion, each one of these people wanted to be doing what they were doing. They were happy to be manipulated by Cecilia because she was the glue that kept their unit together and within that unit they found a kinship of killers. There did not seem to be an end game for this group, as you usually see with cults, where the leader will preach about a specific goal and the group is working towards it. Electus Badeus seemed to be satisfied to kill people they didn't like and then kill people for money. The latter part of their crime series is very telling to me because you do not have to kill people to rob them. There is a myriad of ways to illegally extort money from people without killing them, which makes me think that the murders were their actual focus and the money was an excuse. In fact, LaRue stated in his testimony that they would not have stopped killing if they hadn't been caught. It was easy money and there had been no repercussions for them. Cult leaders will generally isolate their followers, and while the group all stayed in the same block of flats, they were by no means cut off from the rest of the world. Marcel continued to go to school, and Marinda continued to teach. Zach ended up living completely separately from the group while he was in hiding. There was far too much independence and autonomy displayed by the members of this group to be considered a cult, in my opinion. The religious aspects of the group almost seemed secondary, an afterthought by Cecilia to put lipstick on a swan. It is my belief that people like Cecilia get involved in organized religion because they know that they will find vulnerable people at church. I'm not for a minute saying that every person in church is vulnerable, but it is a place of respite. A church is a place where people can go if they are at the end of their tether, and Cecilia knew that. She knew that she could find people to manipulate there. On one end, because the very nature of organized religion is to help one another when one is in need. And on the other end, she would find broken people who came to find healing and instead found predators. 
If Cecilia's intention was to form a cult, she failed miserably, because when faced with the might of the law, all but one of her foot soldiers threw her under the bus. Survivors of real cult situations will often need years of deprogramming to reverse the brainwashing they've undergone. Some are never deprogrammed. All it took for Cecilia's members to be deprogrammed was the click of a key in a jail cell lock. Mickey Pistorius, famed South African profiler, defines a serial killer as follows, quote, A serial killer is a person or persons who murders several victims, usually strangers, at different times, and not necessarily at the same location, with the cooling off period in between. The motive is intrinsic, an irresistible compulsion, fueled by fantasy, which may lead to torture and or sexual abuse, mutilation and necrophilia, end quote. From that definition, the murders fit the term, right up until we get to motive. Two motives have been put forward for the two halves of the Electus Pedia series, and neither seems to fit an irresistible compulsion. Pistorius goes on to explain, though, that irresistible compulsion does not necessarily mean that the person is unable to control his or her actions, just that they choose not to. I personally don't think that we can class even Miranda as a serial killer in the true definition of the word. The first four murders were, if we believe the story, actually fueled by Cecilia's motive, and there is no space in the definition for a serial killer having a motive manipulated upon them. The second series of murders had their purported motive as robbery, which again does not fall within the definition. The rush of excitement that Miranda spoke of when describing killing Reg Ben Dixon is a common theme with serial killers, as is the notion that she was never able to recapture that exact feeling again. I have heard this exact description from a few killers in documentaries. It is also that feeling that has been described as the reason that serial killers will often slightly change their modus operandi. They are looking for exactly the right circumstances to replicate that first rush, which never happens. Marinda Stain will die in jail. She will likely never see her children again. LaRue Stain will be in his 50s when released, and John Barnard will be in his 70s. I am sure that Cecilia Stain is going to receive a very similar sentence to Marinda, if not harsher, considering there's no plea deal in place. I will be surprised if the judge gives Marcel less than 20 years, as he does not consider age as a mitigating factor. Zach Valentine's sentence will be interesting to see, as in some ways I feel his acts were some of the most heinous. Considering he physically committed some of the more brutal murders, there is a good chance that he will never see the light of day again. I have no doubt that Cecilia Stain and possibly Zach Valentine will attempt to appeal their sentences. All of the victims' loved ones received a life sentence too. They will never receive a reprieve from their grief. A town called Krugersdorp will never be the same again, and South Africa has been forced to recognize a new type of predator. Your teacher, the top 10 student, your son-in-law, your long-term trusted employee, your sweet son, and your sickly friend. We have no choice but to admit to ourselves that we have no idea what goes on in the mind of others. I believe that there are many parts of the story that we do not know about. I believe that there are other members of Electus Perdias out there who may not have been directly involved in the crimes, but have a tale to tell. Electus Pedias was not a cult in my opinion, nor can we class any of its members as serial killers. They were simply six people that all had the same dark intention present within them, which remained dormant until they found themselves in the right company. I'm sure that there's a good chance that none of them could have imagined they would have ended up in this situation. There's also a very good chance that if they had not found themselves within such a group, they may never have committed such offences. There is a psychiatric term called folie à deux, which roughly translates as the madness of two. It is the presumption that in certain circumstances, delusions and behavior can be created by the pairing of two very specific people, which, in the absence of that pairing, would likely never have occurred. Perhaps the situation is a case of the madness of six. Thank you for listening to Episode 4, The Krugersdorp Killers, on True Crime South Africa. 
If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a review on the podcatcher you use. Please follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I'd love to hear from you on those platforms. You can also head over to our website, truecrimesouthafrica.com, to read a transcript of this recording and to see pictures related to this case. As always, a huge thank you goes out to the amazing South African band Prime Circle for allowing us to use their song Evidence as our soundtrack. I look forward to chatting to you in our next episode.